If you're in FTC Robotics, one of the easiest ways to lose a match has nothing to do with your code or your build quality. It's your battery. And now they've got a good contact, we're going to go ahead and measure our contacts here. In this video, I'm going to tell you how you can test and ensure that your nickel metal hydride batteries give your robot maximum performance and reliability every single match. Following these steps will help you avoid those frustrating match losing power failures or brownouts of crucial mechanisms. I'm Coach Pratt, and for over a decade, I've been a robotics educator and have coached FTC teams to national championships and winning alliances. The information I'm sharing with you today comes directly from a workshop created by an FTC mentor in Colorado who holds a PhD in electrical engineering. This person is an expert, and they have generously allowed me to share their knowledge with all of you. First, we'll go over the simple, essential day-to-day -day care for your batteries. I'll also show how you can tell if a battery is good because the ability to hold a charge doesn't really tell you the whole story. And if you think this, you're leaving a lot of performance on the table. I'll also show you why and how you can replace that terrible yellow XT30 connector for a much more reliable connector system. So let's start with some basics. First, a huge shout out to the FT Cementor who shared all this incredible information. Their expertise is what makes this video possible. Now they didn't want to be mentioned by name, but their expertise is valuable nonetheless. And I'm continuously surprised at how generous this community is in wanting to grow and create the next generation of engineers. First thing you might be wondering is if one of those FTC batteries is better than another. Like is the Rev Slim battery better than Gobilda? Simply put, all those batteries from all those FTC suppliers are pretty much all the same, except for maybe form factor. The real difference in performance comes from how you take care of them. So here's your checklist. One, you should always just show up to every match with a fully charged battery. Sounds obvious, but not every team does it. Two, for a typical tournament day, you should plan to have three or four batteries ready to go and absolutely bring your charger. Three, when you're charging, you should use a one amp or a thousand milliamp setting. It's a safe and effective rate for these packs. Four, never let your batteries run too low. You want to recharge them when they hit about 11 volts. When a nickel metal hydride cell is completely drained, its polarity can actually reverse, and when that happens, it permanently damages the cell and the entire battery pack. So avoid deep discharging at all costs. Switching gears, how do you know if a battery is still good? Well, simply charging up is not a good enough metric. And let's talk about a key health, internal resistance. Internal resistance is exactly what it sounds like. It's the opposition to current flow inside the battery itself. The higher resistance, the more the battery's voltage is gonna drop when your robot is drawing a lot of current, like when you're accelerating or you're lifting something really heavy. And this voltage drop was caused brownouts and can make your robot disconnect or act unpredictably, like some of your arms working and then all of a sudden not. You can think of it like a hose. You get a lot of water pressure over time, but over time, the internal walls of that hose might get clogged and filled with some gunk. So then that diameter hose starts to shrink. It's not really gonna be a problem if you only need a little trickle, but if you need a lot of water, like you're running a lot of motors, you're gonna run into performance issues with your ability to output a lot of voltage. And that's why internal resistance is so critical. So for a healthy nickel metal hydride pack, you want internal resistance to be under 0.1 ohms. But how do you know that? Well, you can get yourself a smart charger or a battery beak, but those aren't the cheapest options at about 150 a pop. Though if budget's not an issue for you, I've got some links to those in the description down below. If budget is an option, another way is to get a resistor with known value and a multimeter, and you can measure that internal resistance for under $3. And let's take a pause. I'll show you how you can do that with the multimeter now. So over at the workbench here, we need to get a few things set up. Of course, you need a multimeter. I would recommend uh, that you use a, a 10 watt, sorry, a 10 ohm or 25 watt rated resistor. I'll have a link in the description below. And then of course you need your battery. So we need to measure a few things here before we go back and get this data. We need to measure our voltage that is no load or open circuit voltage. And then we also have to remember, know our loaded voltage or our voltage or our resisted load here. So we're going to note down what those two values are before we go back and do some calculations. So I'm gonna go ahead and set my multimeter over here to our DC measuring setting. So we can grab our DC volt. I've got an auto ranging one, which makes this life a lot easier. And all you're simply gonna do is connect your probes in to your battery so we can see what our current no load voltage is. Right now I'm sitting at 13.98 volts. So I'm gonna go ahead and note that down. 13.98 volts is my open circuit voltage. Then 
using your resistor, you don't want to keep this on load for too long because this resistor is going to get hot because we're going to run about one-ish amps through our system here to be able to get our known load. So you, what I've done is I've just taken a couple two and a half millimeter copper wires that I use for standard household electrical, and then I've just wired them up to the resistor, and then we can just plug these straight into the battery terminals. Now again, don't want to connect these, but thankfully this is fused, so you shouldn't be getting anything dangerous here. We're going to go ahead and load these in. And now they've got a good contact. We're going to go ahead and measure our contacts here. And my loaded voltage is 13.73, 13.72 volts. We can see we're starting to drop there. So I'm going to take that off. And I'm going to call that one at 13.72 volts. So 13.72. So now it's time to do some calculations. So we know that our open circuit voltage was 13.98 volts and our loaded voltage was 13.72 volts and our resistor value is 10 ohms. So with this, uh, by the way, all of this comes from a fantastic tutorial by SparkFun. I will share that in the description down below. We can use Ohm's law to get our current that's flowing through on our loaded voltage. So our loaded voltage here, we know, of course, volt, Ohm's law is voltage is equal to current times resistance. So we can grab our loaded voltage, which was 13.72. And then we can put refactor our equation here. And because we're using a 10 ohm resistor, this makes our math really easy. 13.72 divided by 10 is, of course, 1.372 is our current right now. So now we can use Kirchhoff's voltage law to be able to get the voltage that goes over a resistor. So we need to know our uh, open current voltage is equal to our loaded resist voltage plus our voltage that's going over the resistor itself. So we can take our open current voltage, which we know is 13.98, is equal to our voltage over the resistor plus our loaded voltage, which was... 13.72. Of course, if we refactor our equation again, that gives us, what is that? 0 0.26 over is our voltage loss over that resistor. And then we, of course, we can use Ohm's law again to be able to get our internal resistance. So our voltage over the resistor, in this case, was 0 0.26. 0 0.26 times our total current, and our total current was 1.372 amps, 1.372 times our resistance 1. So if we refactor our equation again, which of course is going to take my calculator out for this one, we can take 0.26 and divide it by 1.372, and we're left with a total resistance of 0 0.189. Now, ideal for nickel metal hydride is below 0 0.1, so this battery is definitely going down to the practice pile. I would not suggest you use this battery for competition anymore, as you won't be able to push out all of that amperage that it is that you want. And again, getting one of these super cheap compared to a battery beak. This little part here was about two dollar, two euro and fifty euro cent, so really not too bad. And I think in the U.S. it's about three dollars. You should check your internal resistance value pretty frequently. If a battery starts showing some higher resistance that's over 0.1 ohms, it's a sign that's getting pretty old, and you should move it over to your practice pile, not your competition set. If you can, you should even set aside some of your best and lowest resistance batteries just for competition day. Now, if you find that this video brings value to you and your team, a quick like and subscribe is a free way to support the channel and really helps me making content like this, and it helps me reach more teams like you. Now, my last tip on batteries in general is you gotta be gentle with those connectors and wires, and because this is the part of that battery that sees the most physical stress. Shouldn't carry, shouldn't stretch, or hang your batteries by any other wires, and always make sure that they're secure in the robot. Use some zip ties, use some cable restraint. In fact, it's even better if you ditch that XT30 connector altogether. The only good thing about the XT30s is that they're pretty yellow color and they're polarized, so you can't really plug them in backwards, and that's about where the goods ends. The connections inside an XT30 rely on some weak solder cups to hold the wire, and there's no latching mechanism to keep them plugged in securely. 
That electrical contact is made up of these really tiny, fragile spring fingers that are always under compression. And over time, they weaken and they can lead to a looser intermittent connection. A momentary power loss is all it takes for your robot's control hub mid-match to lose connection and likely you've lost. If you do notice that a connection feels loose, you can very carefully take a small tool like a fine box cutter blade. You can slightly spread out those split contact fingers inside of the connector. And this creates a tighter fit, but it's really a temporary fix. Sometimes you also see those uh, giant Tamiya connectors, those big white chunky ones of batteries. And frankly, those are also just as unreliable. So what's your long-term solution? And that's the upgraded power pull. Anderson power pull connectors are a huge step up in reliability. Instead of a weak solder joint, they use a crimped connection that's rated for tens of thousands of connections and disconnections. The contact pressure doesn't come from a flimsy piece of metal. It uses a steel leaf spring and copper contact clips to ensure you've got a solid connection every time. The contacts come in different amperage ratings, 15, 30, 45. They're all versions that fit in the same plastic housing. And I'd suggest you use the 30 amp versions for FTC batteries. To install these properly, you're going to need a special ratcheting crimp tool, and that's really designed for them. And to be honest, don't even try to use regular pliers because you're simply not going to get a reliable crimp. Now, the downsides of that power pool is it's a little bit bigger than XT30s and they cost a bit more. But when you consider that a single loss match due to a bad connection could be the difference between advancing and going home, I'd say that the investment in reliable connectors is absolutely worth it. So here's some information on how you can connect these to your battery. And I know you need a specialized ratcheting tool, but maybe the savings you got from a battery beak might be able to pick yourself up one of these. And trust me, you're going to thank yourself in the future. So the recap, keep your batteries charged, don't run them too low, and monitor that internal resistance. Be aware of the weaknesses of the XT30 connectors, and if you can, make a switch over to those Anderson power poles. Taking care of your batteries is a simple discipline that can have a huge impact on your team's success. Thanks for watching, and best of luck out there this season.